Welcome to the ONC Insights into API Use to Enable Data Sharing Between EHRs and Apps webinar. My name is Tom Deneen with Kaufman & Associates and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To ask questions, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have general comments, please click the chat button also at the bottom of your screen. This will pull up the chat box, which will open to the right side of your Zoom interface. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located at the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will allow you to see the speaker as they are presenting. Their information, sorry. If you need technical assistance during this session, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our techs will respond to you. Finally, please be aware that today's session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Wesley Barker. Thank you. And uh, yeah, welcome to everyone to our uh, presentation today, Insights into API Use to Enable Data Sharing Between EHRs and Apps. Next slide, please. Next slide. So a little bit of background on the content of today's presentation. Uh, the presentations today will showcase results from several studies that ONC and its partners uh, completed that examined data sharing between EHRs and apps from, from several different perspectives. So we consider um, perspectives from the healthcare provider specifically through, um, through our, uh, the AHA Health IT Supplement, which surveys the chief information officers for US hospitals. Uh, we also uh, had surveyed app developers uh, through a, a survey led by the University of California at San Francisco, and have done a number of different market research projects that you know sort of measure and um, you know better understand uh, the scope of app development and integration with EHRs. And additionally, we have a presentation today that provides perspective, a patient perspective, particularly new results from Hint Six, which is the uh, Health Information National Trend Survey, which is fielded by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, you know those, the results from uh, from that survey, which we'll share today, provide you know a, a patients' um, experience you know using digital technology, um, and you know all of these perspectives provide us you know to you know help us better understand the how, what, and why about data sharing with EHRs and apps. And I think you know as as you know everyone I think will will find a very interesting story is is sort of woven that um, kind of connects all of these different experiences and studies, you know, um, into, you know, one cohesive uh, sort of story and picture about, you know, the progress that's made, made in terms of the, uh, the use of APIs to enable data sharing and uh, the use of, you know, apps in particular um, uh, to access health information and, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, deliver healthcare. And um, you know, I think it's really important to highlight you know, several of the factors that sort of shape the current state that we're going to be talking about today. And you know, we've sort of kind of built them in as three main ones. I think you know, a big uh, factor is uh, the original decade-old efforts by the JSON, the JSON Task Force and the Argonet Project to sort of scope out EHR and third-party app data sharing through standards-based APIs. And so that work, you know, which is uh, yeah, about a decade old has really led to, you know, in particular, a lot of what was proposed, what was passed in the 21st Century Cures Act, and then ultimately how ONC and um, and CMS implemented Cures Act rulemaking um, several years ago. In particular, ONC's Cures Final Rule, which was finalized in 20 in uh, April 2020, uh, set the standards for API-based data sharing um, for certified health information technology. And then finally, but certainly not least, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really, ex really accelerated the demands for virtual care and digital access. And so, you know, a lot of the sort of historical efforts that preceded the pandemic really culminated in, you know, I think the availability of, you know, more digital access tools and virtual care options for patients. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, it, interesting trends that have, uh, that have occurred. Um, you know, given the events of the pandemic. And so, you know, three years since ONC finalized its Cures Act rulemaking and a decade after Jason, um, I think today's, you know, today's uh, presentations will really show how things have changed. And, you know, uh, we can certainly consider what is to come. Next slide, please. 
So we've got you know four core presentations um, and uh, you know a sort of discussion presentation that will follow them that that uh, that folks will give today um, from you know the data analysis branch here at ONC, um, Captain Shrawley, uh, Doctors Chelsea Richwine and Jordan Everson will provide um, you know presentations on various topics, um, and they were also joined by our colleague Dr. Natalia Meisel. The Associate Director for the Center for Clinical Informatics and Improvement Research at the University of Cal California, San Francisco, who will uh, provide a presentation on uh, research that they have done um, into digital health company experiences with EHR APIs. Next slide, please. All right. It's my pleasure to hand it off to my colleague, Catherine Strawley, who will provide the next presentation. Thank you, Wes. Um, hello, everyone. As Wes said, my name is Catherine Strawley. I'm a public health analyst here at ONC in the data analysis branch. Um, in this next section of the presentation, I'm going to provide you all a little bit of information about some analyses we've done with hospital use of APIs to enable data sharing between EHRs and apps. Next slide, please. Great. And then to give you all some insight about the data and methodology we use for the analyses that I'm about to present. Uh, data are from the American Hospital Association Health Information Technology Supplement, uh, specifically for the years of the survey 2020 and 2022. As a quick note, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020 instrument was not fielded until 2021, so we'll refer to 2021 and 2022 data. Um, and this, this survey, the AHA survey, is sent to each U.S. hospital CEO, and then for the health IT supplement in particular, the person at the hospital who's most knowledgeable about the hospital's health IT is invited to respond to those questions, and that's typically the CIO. For these analyses, we're looking specifically at non-federal acute care hospitals. And in the for the 2020 instrument, we had a 54% response rate. The 2022 survey instrument fielded last year had a 59% response rate. And these data from these these two surveys were used to assess hospital use of both clinician and patient APIs to enable a variety of functionalities, which we'll define in the next few slides. Um, and we'll, we'll compare um, hospital enablement of these various functionalities across years and various characteristics by um, hospital, hospital characteristics and hospital health IT. And then just as a quick methodological note, any missing responses were removed from the denominators for each of these analyses. Next slide, please. All right, so first to define what some of these functionalities mean, uh, here we're looking at the clinician um, APIs and functionalities enabled by those APIs. On the left, we have some definitions. And then on the right, in a table, we have the corresponding questions in the health IT supplement to the AHA survey. Um, so you'll, you'll notice the response options for each of these questions are yes, no, and don't know. And I'll, I'll let you all have a look at, at those specific questions as I'm uh, defining each of these functionalities. But basically, if, if a hospital responded yes to each of these respective questions, that hospital was considered to have this functionality enabled. So first, we have right to EHR, and that's defined as integration of data from a third-party software into a hospital's EHR. Read EHR data, which is providing data from a hospital's EHR to third-party applications used by clinicians in the same hospital or health system. And then finally, on the slide, read non-EHR data, which is providing data from sources other than the EHR to third-party apps used by clinicians at a hospital or health system. Next slide, please. Right. And next, we have patient access functionalities. Uh, so again, here we have questions uh, from the survey that were used to inform our analysis and tell us whether a hospital had enabled patient access um, using an API. So the overarching question is, are patients who received care provided by your hospital or outpatient sites able to do the following? So either access their info using apps configured to meet API specifications in your EHR or access their information using apps configured to meet fire specifications. And then the response options here at the right are yes, at some or all inpatient sites, yes, at some or all outpatient sites, no, and do not know. 
And for these questions, if a hospital indicated yes at some or all inpatient sites or yes at some or all outpatient sites to either of these kind of sub questions at the left, um, they were considered to have enabled patient access. All right, next slide, please. And then our next piece here, our next functionality is patient generated data submission. Um, so this is actually, you know, again, looking at the survey questions, um, and these are additional subparts of the same questions. So are patients basically either able to submit patient generated data just generally or submit patient generated data through apps configured to meet fire specifications? And again, if, if the hospital responded either yes at some or all inpatient sites or yes at some or all outpatient sites to either of these sub questions here at the left, then they were considered um, and counted in our analysis to have enabled patient generated data submission. All right, next slide, please. All right, so here our first visualization um, shows hospital use of APIs to share data with apps, um, looking at each of the functionalities that we just defined. So for our patient APIs, um, enablement of patient access and patient generated data submission and for clinician APIs, um, the ha having enabled the functionalities to write to the EHR, read EHR data and read non-EHR data. And the big takeaway here is that about four in five, four in five hospitals reported using APIs to enable apps to write data to the EHR, read EHR data and support patient access functionalities through apps. And the proportion of hospitals that reported um, using APIs to enable patient-generated data submission and read non-EHR data, um, that's a, a bit lower. But what we see really across the board here is that um, hospitals are using mostly standards-based APIs for these purposes really across the board. All right, next slide, please. All right, next we have hospital use of APIs to enable patient access. So we're looking at both hospitals using a fire API specifically to enable patient access, as well as hospitals using only a non-fire API to enable patient access, as well as um, hospitals that are enabling patients to submit patient generated data to apps. And we're comparing here uh, between 2021 and 2022. And what we see is that for 2022 specifically, two in three hospitals reported using a FHIR API to enable patient access to data through apps, which is a significant increase year over year that um, you know, equals to 12 percentage points. And while we see a significant, statistically significant increases for patient generated data submission and patient access using a non fire API only, uh, those two categories stayed relatively level from 2021 to 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Great, right, thank you. All right, and here we have a table looking at hospital use of APIs to enable patient access and submit patient generated data. So still looking at the same functionalities as in our prior slide, but this time stratifying uh, by hospital characteristics as well as health IT characteristics. So again, looking at differences between 2021 and 2022. And then for our health IT characteristics, we're looking at whether a hospital uses a top three market leading EHR or not, and that would be Epic, Cerner, or Meditech, and whether a hospital is considered small or medium to large, as well as whether a hospital is independent or system affiliated. So here we see that the percentage of hospitals offering patient access through apps using a FHIR API has increased year over year across all of these stratifications. Um, however, we do note that for hospitals using a top three market leading EHR that are larger in size um, or that have a system affiliation are consistently reporting patient access uh, enabled through these FHIR APIs at a higher rate compared to their counterparts. Um, that being said, in terms of year over year growth, we do note that the use of a FHIR API to enable patient access grew faster among hospitals that are small compared to larger hospitals, but slower among hospitals using a non-market leading EHR than you know, those using a market leading EHR, as well as slower among those hospitals that are independent compared to those that are system affiliated. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, and now we, we move on and continue to chat more about our patient API enabled function, sorry, clinician API enabled functionalities. So specifically looking at read EHR data, read non-EHR data, and write to the EHR. So here we have a Euler diagram that kind of shows the overlap and how many hospitals are, you know, using a combi various combinations of these uh, functionalities. So what we see is that four in 10 hospitals um, have enabled apps to read EHR data and non-EHR data, as well as write to the EHR. And then when we look even closer at these overlaps, we see that among hospitals that enabled apps to write data to the EHR, 85% also enabled apps to read data from the EHR. And then among hospitals that enabled apps to read non-EHR data, 91% also allowed apps to read EHR data. And then of course, um, you see the red reddish circle in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, where about 16% of respondents indicated that they had not enabled any of these functionalities. Okay, right, next slide, please. Okay, right, and then we also look at the methods used by hospitals to enable each of these same functionalities. Um, so here we're looking specifically among hospitals who had enabled read EHR data functionalities, write to EHR data functionalities, and read non-EHR data functionalities. So we can see the proportion of hospitals, again, with each respective functionality enabled that are using proprietary APIs for this purpose, standards-based APIs, and data integrator services for these purposes. Um, these three bars are not mutually exclusive, but we do note that across hospitals with each of these functionalities, a large portion are using standards-based APIs, and that proportion is significantly larger than those that are using proprietary APIs. However, you know, if, if you look at, um, I guess they're kind of appearing gray, the gray bars for standards-based APIs only, we see that the proportion of hospitals using standards-based APIs only for each functionality kind of drops quite a bit from, from you know, the standards-based API red uh, bar there. So that could be an indication that um, maybe our, our standards-based APIs aren't perfect, and there's some need to, you know, complement their use for each of these functionalities with proprietary APIs or data integrator services. All right, next slide, please. All right, and then continuing to look at these same functionalities for reading EHR data and non-EHR data, as well as writing to EHR data, we are looking specifically at 2022 data here and stratifying by, again, the same hospital and health IT characteristics that we looked at previously for our patient access and patient generated data submission. And what we notice here, and you know, we, we kind of saw this um, in our last table that was kind of similar to this, uh, is that hospitals using a market leading EHR, those that are larger in size and those that are system affiliated more frequently reported using APIs to enable each of these functionalities compared to their counterparts. So we, we do see some disparities in, again, enablement of these functionalities based upon these different characteristics. All right, next slide, please. All right, and then this is just a table that we're going to build upon throughout the rest of the session. Um, we'll add column-wise uh, just to summarize the main findings from each section. So main takeaways here, 86% of hospitals reported the enablement of patient access to data and 69% of hospitals use standards-based APIs specifically for that purpose. 82% of hospitals enabled APIs to write to the EHR and 78% enable read of EHR data. And then finally, really across the board with those functionalities, we saw that standards-based APIs are used most frequently. Great, next slide, please. And I'll pass it off to Chelsea. Great, 
Thank you, Catherine. So, well, Catherine highlighted some findings from a survey of, of hospitals. Um, this presentation is really focused on um, patient experiences um, and patients' access to electronic health information um, and highlighting some findings from the Health Information National Trend Survey. Next slide. So as I just mentioned, this study is, or these figures are really highlighting data from, from actually three waves of the Health Information National Trend Survey, um, HINTS for short, which is a nationally representative survey of U.S. adults that tracks individuals' access and use of health-related information. So it asks a lot of questions about um, both their knowledge of this information and its use. Um, the, the latest data come from HINTS 6, which was fielded in 2022. So these are, these are actually very new data that were released um, just about a week ago, um, April, end of April. Um, and I compare these to some figures in a pooled sample of 2019 and 2020 data. So this is HINTS 5 cycles 3 and 4. Um, the, the sample that I looked at um, was restricted to respondents who had a healthcare visit in the past 12 months. Um, and I did this for, for two reasons, um, to look at um, those who had a reason to access their online medical record, um, as well as to mitigate any chance of, of response bias. If, you know, if individuals hadn't had a, a healthcare visit in the past, you know, couple years, they, they may not remember um, certain um, aspects of, you know, whether they were offered a patient portal or accessed it or, you know, what they did with their online health information. So we did this make, make this restriction to those who, who accessed their online medical record in the past year. Um, and finally, we described several outcomes uh, related to patients' engagement with their electronic health information or their EHI, um, which I'll often use for short, via online medical records or through patient portals. Um, and all analyses did use survey weighting procedures provided by HINTS, um, and this is to account for non-response as well as for the complex survey design. Um, and all of these um, details are available actually on the HINTS website, which is linked here. Once the slides are available, um, the data are publicly available as well as the, the supporting documentation. Uh, next slide. So this first figure shows patient reported access to their online medical record or patient portal uh, between 2019 um, and 2020. So that's that pooled sample compared to 2022. Um, and I just want to highlight these definitions. And when I say offered a patient portal, this is referring to patient reports of being offered online access to their medical records, um, such as a patient portal, by their healthcare provider or their insurer. Um, so this is um, offer portal on the far left side. This increased from 64% in 2019 to 2020, increased significantly to 79% as of 2022, patients reporting that they were offered access to their portal. Um, in other words, they had the opportunity to access it. Um, the second measure is whether patients reported being encouraged to use their portal. So above and beyond that offer of, you know, having those portal credentials, this is patient reports of being encouraged by any of their healthcare providers, including their doctors, nurses, or office staff, to actually use that online medical record or patient portal. And this also increased significantly from 55% in 2019 and 2020 uh, up to 73% in 2022. Um, and finally, in the far right, this is the share of patients who access their portal. This is patient reports of accessing an online medical record or patient portal at least once in the past 12 months. Um, this increased from 45% in 2019 and 2020 up to 68% in 2022. So really marked uh, progress um, in, in various measures of patient access, um, both on the provider side of offering and encouraging portals, as well as on the patient side of accessing the portal in the past couple of years. Next slide. So this figure is showing the methods used um, by patients to access their online medical record or patient portal. Um, and this, this question was asked for the first time in 2020. So this is just comparing um, 2020 to 2022. Um, and on the, on the far, you know, on the top um, part of this, um, of the bar, it shows the share of patients who access their information via only an app. Um, and the middle bar in the red is showing the share of patients who access it via only a website. And then in the yellow, this is showing both app and website-based access, um, and then a small share of individuals who didn't know. Um, so it's it's worth highlighting here that while app-only-based access increased um, just slightly from 16 to 19% um, in, um, in 2022, um, 
the share of individuals who only access their information via website uh, declined significantly from 60% in 2020 down to 47% in 2022. Um, and this is largely because a lot of that shift is going to individuals accessing their information through both an app and a website from 21% in 2020 up to 32% in 2022. So overall, um, we see a big shift in app-based access um, in the last couple of years. Uh, next slide. So in the HINT survey, um, it's not directly presented here, um, but one of the questions asks um, what share of patients have more than one online medical record. And about 44% indicated that they had multiple records. And this could be through um, their primary health care provider, but also through other specialty um, providers from their insurer, even pharmacy or lab. Um, and so the following question asked, you know, among those who had multiple portals, have you ever used an app such as Apple Health Records or Common Health to combine your medical information from these different patient portals or online medical records into one place? Um, you can see here that this is this is not that common yet. Only 5% of that 40% said yes, that they're doing this, but the vast majority at 95% said no. Um, so this is something that we're going to uh, continue to track over time and, and see whether this app use um, increases to, to kind of to combine this information in, in one place. Next slide. Um, and the final thing I will touch on related to patient access is the share of patients that indicated that they share their health information uh, from either an electronic monitoring device or a smartphone with a healthcare provider or professional within the last 12 months. Um, and this is coming just from HIN6 in 2022. Um, most, most individuals, about three quarters of the sample said no, that they had not done this. 20% said yes. And a small share, about 7% said this wasn't applicable because they didn't have a smartphone or electronic monitoring device. Um, so again, some, some, you know, a small, relatively small portion here, but something else that will continue to trend and, you know, look at the increasing share of patients, not just accessing their information, but also using it and sending it and sharing it um, over time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is kind of just building on this summary of findings here. One thing to highlight that over half of individuals reported accessing their online med medical record via app in 2022. Um, and I will, before I pass this on, I'll see if there's any questions in the chat related to this specific comment. Um, yeah, I can. Do you want to take a look, Chelsea, or did you want me to? Yeah, can you read it out loud read and I'll out? take a look? Yeah. Absolutely. So from uh, from Janice, we have a, a question. Did the survey track the inability to access a portal? For instance, many patient portals are not accessible to folks with certain disabilities, disabilities most notably visual impairments. Yeah, so this is actually uh, one of the first years where this question was taking out, but there was a, there was a question about why did you not uh, access your online portal, but this has been asked for several years, so it is available in 2020. And you know, happy to drop a resource in the chat um, on a recent paper that published these findings. Um, but there are certainly there are a couple access related issues that were cited as of 2020. Um, so you know, not being able to access it or finding it difficult to log in for for whatever reason. But honestly, the the two. Really the biggest one, the vast majority of patients said um, they didn't access their portal because they just simply preferred to speak with their provider directly. So that was the most common reason. Um, a couple said that, um, or there was a, you know, a, there are a couple other reasons related to like the privacy or security of the website um, or concerns about that. Um, so again, happy to, to share that paper that highlights some of those findings from 2020. Um, but also is publicly available data. So you can certainly see the breakdown in 2020. And this may be a returning question in the, the next iteration of the hints. Um, and then some other questions uh, come up, um, Chelsea, as you were talking. Um, and, you know, I think they get, a, you know, uh, along some of the, um, Sort of related to your your presentation on the um, uh, the percentage of patient or percentage of individual Americans who say that they you know combine their medical records in like a PHR um, mm -hmm. app, for instance, and um, you know I think uh, um, let me see if I can. Uh, there's a one specific question from Christopher. I think I'll I'll, I'll 
I'll sort of paraphrase. Okay. Um, but you know, specifically asking about you know how the hint survey questions um, actually ask about how the app is pulling in data from multiple sources. You know, I think you did sort of get at that and and um, on this slide. Um, but I think you know, just bring attention to you know Christopher's question about you know how we how the question is actually asking a survey. Um, so I don't think yeah. it necessarily needs a specific answer now, but you know. Um, you know, just a suggestion for, you know, how we ask it. Sure. That's really helpful. So I, I just read the question and I will, I will note in response that um, we are, you know, as ONC, we're kind of content champions for hints and are involved in drafting the questions related to EHRs. And so um, this is certainly noted because we're in the process soon of um, pilot testing or cognitive testing some of these questions. So um, that's a really helpful consideration. It's certainly something we could, you know, consider. Um, so I appreciate that suggestion. All right, I think we're good. Great. Thank you, Thanks. Chelsea. Thank you. And so I'll pass it on to Natalia for her presentation. Great. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for having me here today. So today I'll be talking about a survey we conducted with several partners, including the California Healthcare Foundation, ONC, and Scale Health. Uh, next slide, please. The goal of this project was to conduct a large national survey of digital health companies to capture a current snapshot of what type of integrations have been attempted with commercial EHRs, what are the main barriers faced during integrations with commercial EHRs using APIs, and what's the perceived or observed impact of federal policy on integration efforts. Next slide, please. So our approach was to identify digital health companies that are currently or previously attempting to integrate with commercial EHRs. And we use sources listed here, such as public EHR app galleries, and we had a very helpful expert advisory board. Our sampling frame ended up including 704 companies. We also had a few completers from outside the list since we sent the survey out to some broad listservs. Um, and I'll be presenting on data from 141 companies today. Next slide, please. To give you a sense of the domains these companies are working in, you can see that about 83% of the companies were integrating in the domain of care delivery, such as clinical decision support, uh, telehealth, clinical messaging. So that's definitely the biggest area in our sample. And then a little less than half of companies had products in the domain of patient access. About 42% had products in the domain of population health. And then the list kind of keeps going down for admin, uh, clinical research, and smaller for public health. Next slide, please. Our first main question was to understand the types of integrations companies have attempted with commercial EHRs. And we asked about RESTful proprietary APIs. Um, and RESTful standards-based APIs. So we asked if companies were integrating with either one. And as you can see in this figure, about 68% had successfully integrated with commercial EHRs uh, via proprietary RESTful APIs, and 73% had integrated using standard-based uh, standards RESTful APIs. And standards-based here refers to the API, APIs required under the 21st Century Cures Act um, as implemented by, by CMS and ONC. Next slide, please. Companies, of course, could be doing both, both types of these integrations, and they were. We had 57% of companies that reported that they had both of these types of integrations in production. So over half of the companies were using both the standard space and the proprietary. Next slide, please. So that was about integration via different types of RESTful APIs, but we also asked about non-RESTful APIs and non-API-based integrations, such as SFTP and HL7 version 2. And we had about 57% of companies that were integrating using these non-RESTful APIs or other approaches that don't really rely on APIs. And for the companies that were relying on these non-RESTful API approaches, we asked a follow-up and about 67% of companies agreed with the statement, we're using approaches that do not rely on RESTful APIs because current RESTful APIs are not able to meet our business needs. Next slide, please. Next, we asked about fire use, and we had 85% of companies reporting that they use fire in their products, with 61% using it extensively and 24% in a limited way. For, the, for those that were using fire, we had 71% of companies that said they routinely use smart on fire. Next slide, please. 
And what about the specific EHR vendors that the companies are integrating with? Um, about 82% of the companies that took the survey said they were already integrating with Epic or had those integrations underway. You can see that Cerner is the next big one with 60% 60 60 integrating successfully or integrations underway. About half were working with Athena Health, 35% uh, with Allscripts, and then um, some of the percentages start to drop. Next slide, please. Uh, we don't have a lot of longitudinal data um, similar you know, to what you'll see in some of the other talks, but there was a survey that was conducted in 2016. It was a different sample and different methods, um, but companies were asked about their integrations with different EHR vendors, any kind of integration, not just RESTful API based. And one thing that seems to have changed over these last seven years is that in 2016, Epic and Allscripts had sort of similar rates of integrations and those were followed by Athena Health and then Cerner. And in our 2022 data that I just presented, um, you know, Epic's kind of jumped out of the pack as the most common EHR vendor for integrations. And now Cerner is the second most common. And that change, I think, seems consistent with, you know, other market share work. Next slide, please. When we looked at fire use a bit more, we found that if a company is only integrating with one vendor, only about 27% of those companies are using fire extensively. But once a company is integrating with more than one vendor, vendor fire use more than doubles. Next slide, please. And in terms of the level of use of API-based commercial EHR integrations, the most common function is read. Uh, basically, almost at 100% of companies are using that. Then we have update and create with about 24% of the samples saying that they use those extensively. And finally, delete is the least commonly used with only 8% of companies using it extensively. Next slide, please. This graph shows the level of use for specific types with patient demographics the most common at almost 100% of companies using this extensively or in a limited way. Next, we have conditions and diagnoses, uh, then orders, then clinical notes, and then lab tests and results, all of those with over 75% using them extensively or in a limited way. Next slide, please. We also asked about the biggest barriers to integration, and about 47% of companies rated high fees as a substantial barrier to integrating with EHRs. Then we had the lack of realistic testing data, uh, not having data elements that were of interest or value, and lack of standards-based APIs were all commonly rated as substantial barriers by about 40% uh, of the sample. And then you can see some other barriers that were rated as substantial by about a third of the sample. We had um, lack of standardized data elements and difficulty accessing API endpoints. Next slide, please. And finally, we asked about the impact of federal policy on making it easier to use APIs with commercial EHRs or payers. So one thing I think of interest here is the dark, uh, the bars in dark blue on the right-hand side are the don't know percentages, um, which are quite high for this question. And so at the bottom there, 45% of companies didn't know whether or not CMS Blue Button 2.0 was making it easier to use APIs. And over half, 55% uh, didn't know if Tefco was making it easier or not to integrate with commercial EHRs or payers. And then if you look at the lightest colored uh, blue bars on the left-hand side, those are the percentages of companies that reported that the federal policy was helping moderately or to a great extent. So you could see that 39% uh, of companies said that HL7 fire accelerators were making it easier to integrate. 42% said that the 21st Century Cures Act info blocking regulations were making it easier. And in particular, 50% said that the Cures Act API regulations were making it easier to integrate. Next slide, please. So just to sum up some key points here, um, many companies are integrating with commercial EHRs using both standard-based and proprietary APIs and also non-API-based integration approaches. We found broad use of FHIR, particularly when integrating with multiple vendors, um, but only about 61% of companies use it extensively. Companies reported a wide array of barriers to using APIs with high fees as the top barrier. And there seemed to be some limited awareness of regulations that will impact the industry. Um, next slide, please. So just to kind of add, a, add my column here to the developers column, uh, we, we found that 46% of companies had patient access as a primary application domain in that first row. Uh, for looking at rates of health, health system care delivery apps, 
we found that 83% of companies had care delivery as a primary application domain. And for that last row, uh, we had that 73% um, of companies had standards-based API integrations in production. And before I turn it over to Wes, I can, uh, if there's any kind of clarifying questions or anything like that. Yeah, there's a few questions um, that I can like, you know, verbally ask if that's all right with you, Natalia. That'd be great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, one question uh, asked, uh, were, were any of the individual questions tracked by provider apps versus patient apps? Uh, you mean like sort of was there a split between provider? No, there it was at the most of the questions were asked very generally about kind of any of the of the apps. So we don't have that kind of branching, though that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one clarifying question about the standardized RESTful APIs a response option in the survey. Um, some interest in, you know, that the, um, it, you know, the question or the response option was restricted to API specifically outlined in the federal regulations. And the you know, question asked whether, you know, other fire-based or standards-based APIs were considered in any way uh, in the survey. Um, yeah, I think I would have to go back and you know, maybe I'll put in the chat the sort of the exact language we used because I think I was maybe kind of using that as an example. And uh, let me let me find the exact language we used for the standards based. So maybe that would help uh, clarify that a little. Mm -hmm. Great. And then one last question. Um, a question from the audience asked uh, whether or not any of the uh, survey questions asked companies if um, they did anything to address the barriers that they identified. Oh, that's um, a good such question. Such as submitting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we we don't we didn't have a specific question. I don't think Wes, you could correct me if I'm wrong about that, but we did have some open-ended um responses that I think, you know, people probably did bring up some things that they do to get around some of those barriers. So I think when we kind of have the, you know, so, sort of full report paper, we'll probably look go back and look at a lot of those open-ended ones. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that yeah, that's right. We there is like sort of I think it one or two places where yeah respondent could kind of provide yeah free text ideas or um, suggestions for improvement and things like that, which I think will be really interesting. Yeah. That's that's it. Those are the, the questions. Thank you, Natalia. Great. Thanks. And I will turn it over to you, Wes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Natalia. So I'm I'm gonna sort of finish off the presentation. Uh, with this, um, and this last one, simply titled "Changes in the App Marketplace," and this one sort of gets into two different studies that you know we've conducted, um, you know, starting in about 2019. Uh, one study, uh, or I should say, the first presentation is sort of an update on a study that um, was published in Jamia in 2021 uh, that looked at you know some of the different EHR app galleries. Um, that were, you know, that started to sort of arise uh, sort of in the late 20, 20 teens um, and sort of, per, you know, better understand the types of apps and sort of the you know, scope of the market, um, you know, using those specific data sources. So it's, it's a limited um, set of data, but, you know, it does provide interesting insights um, into sort of uh, the types of apps and, and uh, sort of use cases. Um, that were, you know, you know, starting to arise and, you know, you know, uh, were integrated into EHRs and available for end users to use. Um, and then the second study will sort of um, deviate, you know, from those specific data sources and look specifically at um, an analysis that we conducted using um, App Store data, using the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store data, in particular looking at medical apps. Uh, in those health and medical apps in those marketplaces uh, to better to get a better grasp of the types of uh, patient access apps that um, you know smartphone users are installing and using on their phones. Next slide, please. So yeah, so as I described, um, this you know first study uh, focused on. Um, an analysis of the apps that are discoverable in some of the market leading EHR uh, app galleries. So the uh, uh, Allscripts, Athena Health, Cerner, and Epic EHR app galleries, 
and the SMART app gallery. Um, we're both included in this study, which we began in 2019 and have continued through the end of 2022. And, you know, the uh, sort of the methods of this study is that we uh, sort of created individual programmatic parsers for each of these, you know, galleries. And so, you know, had a programmatic method that, you know, pulled this data from the websites directly in a um, recurring way, you know, over, you know, monthly, quarterly, annually um, time frames to sort of get like a sort of general real time understanding of the types of apps and growth over time in the number of apps and, you know, their use cases, you know, across these different data sources. And it is limited, but, you know, there are limited data sources as well. Um, there are some, you know, other EHR uh, developers and a few other, you know, similar types of, um, you know, app marketplaces that exist, but, you know, the core part of the study focuses on these, um, particularly all scripts of Tina, Cerner, and Epic, as uh, they are market leaders um, in the space. Um, so, you know, overall from 2019, when we started the study through 2022, um, the number of apps discovered across all these data sources uh, nearly doubled. I mean, about 80% increase overall. Um, and as you can see from sort of the, uh, uh, the trend lines in the graphic, you know, most of that growth occurred up until about 2021, a big surge, you know, from 2019 to 2020. And then um, their growth started to slow after 2021. And in particular in 2022, um, you know, the number of apps overall that were discovered across these sources really started to decrease. Um, and, you know, part of the study was also kind of looking at the, the number of apps that also describe support for the DeFire Data Exchange Standard. And so we started, you know, examining that in 2019 and have continued to do that through 2022. And so, you know, the ability to kind of understand that from the data sources is limited, um, you know, in the, the published manuscript on this original study in 2021, we kind of go into some quality checks that we did to kind of like, you know, understand, um, you know, the, uh, you know, how effective like our um, methodology was in short tracking it. But, you know, basically a lot of it was just sort of text mining of the app descriptions and the websites for the app developers themselves to understand like any sort of support or, you know, described a use of fire as part of their applications, um, you know, and sort of software architecture. And so, you know, given those limited methods and data, you know, we were, you know, we're able to track that across all of these apps um, that we discovered through these data sources. And we did see, you know, overall, you know, um, 125 percent increase in the number of apps that um, that support and fire over this time, which is you know greater than the overall increase in the apps overall. So you know overall greater portion of apps each year were supporting fire than the next. Next slide. And it was totally necessary to be completely transparent about you know, the number of apps represented in each of these marketplaces. So as I said, um, you know, the all scripts Athena Health Cerner and Epic EHR app galleries were, um, you know, part of the study in addition to the smart app gallery. You can see here that over the course of our study period from 2019 to 2022, the Epic represented most of the increase. Um, you can see here that the apps discovered in the Cerner gallery definitely increased um, over this period of time, um, a substantial increase, but they, you know, started at a lower level. Um, and, you know, the increase uh, in the Athena marketplace, you know, also went up as well in that, in the time period, but um, really, you know, the, um, the, uh, the increase uh, in the, the Epic app orchard uh, was substantial and made up, you know, a considerable amount of the increase overall in our study. Um, next slide, please. And so, you know, a key, another key part of the study was kind of looking at the apps themselves and what they do. So, you know, to kind of better organize and contextualize the study, we sort of group the apps into four sort of non mutually exclusive categories. So there's certainly a lot of overlap here. I think even Natalia's presentation showed the amount of overlap that the respondents to, to that survey um, described in terms of, you know, the uh, overall functionalities of their apps. And, you know, as folks may be aware, you know, many apps do more than just one thing. And in, in healthcare, if you do one thing, you know, you're probably limiting your overall use case to your users. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the apps in our study did more than one thing, but, you know, it's still important to sort of 
kind of be able to describe, you know, what those things are and, you know, in what sort of general category do they fit in. And so, you know, we sort of define those four categories as administrative, uh, which, you know, if the app describes any support for like, you know, billing, payment, scheduling, patient intake, you know, your basic sort of check-in type um, processes, uh, clinical use, which is particularly focused on like, you know, actual clinician use of the app and thing, you know, specific thing, you know, specific functionalities that they would use uh, as part of patient care or general health care that would include population health, clinical statistics and support, analytics and research type, function type functionalities. And then there's patient care functionalities, uh, the patient care category. And, um, you know, that could go both ways. That could be something that the patient uses. That could be something that the clinician uses uh, to care for the patient. And I think you can see like, you know, with some of the uh, subcategories in there with like telehealth, remote care, um, medication management, you know, a lot of those things could include both patient and clinician interaction. Um, and then finally, uh, the uh, fourth category is patient engagement, which is sort of very specifically focused on, you know, things, you know, that are out, maybe specifically outside the specific tele, you know, patient care functionalities. So not telehealth, not remote care, uh, which is, you know, we grouped as more patient care functionalities, whereas patient engagement um, functionalities are more focused on patient communication, patient experience, marketing, acquisition. So ways that, you know, the, um, the, the app users, particularly the clinician, you know, interacts with their patients and gets them more engaged in their, in their healthcare, or, you know, in some cases showing up for appointments and uh, getting them to, um, you know, follow through on, uh, you know, uh, the um, diagnostics and recommendations of the clinician. Um, and next slide. And so, you know, this chart kind of takes the first, uh, the first chart and kind of segments this out by the different app uh, categories that we defined. Um, and so you can see here sort of uh, the first bars for each of the uh, individual uh, topic sections. Um, are the uh, the totals for 2019, and then we have the totals for 2022, um, and then the apps are further sort of you know uh, segmented by whether or not um, the apps support fire or do not support fire. And so you can sort of see you know overall increases in all the categories over time. I think you know we saw a substantial increase in uh, patient care, clinical use apps, um, uh, clinical use apps over time, um, and in particular administrative apps as well. And I think. We, you know, published another study, excuse me, earlier this year in AGMC uh, that sort of um, kind of looked at some of these uh, different functionalities that particularly emerged, um, or particular types of apps that emerged during the pandemic that were providing more sort of like digital check-in, you know, digital front door and um, some more administrative functionalities that really helped facilitate, um, you know, care interactions and, and scheduling appointments and things like that. And so I think there was, you know, pretty good increase in the number of apps overall that um, support administrative functionalities. And I think a lot of that was, you know, particularly driven by some of the needs of the pandemic. Um, but, you know, I think mean, looking at like, you know, the percentage of apps overall, it's also, you know, important to look at what we found in terms of the percent of these different apps that support Fire as well. Because, you know, as we look towards, you know, standard-based methods of, you know, it, you know, integration and data exchange between apps and EHRs, you know, thinking through, like, you know, some of the, um, the early adoption of the FHIR standard across some of these apps, and, you know, that might fit into, you know, what FHIR itself supports and what some of the standard-based APIs um, are designed to, uh, to support, at least initially. So you can see, you know, some you know, different um, described support for FHIR across these app categories. Um, you know, clinical use patient care apps about one in three uh, describe support for fire, whereas administrative apps about one in ten did. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, I think just interesting sort of uh, segmentation of the data to better understand you know where the increases in the total number of apps were over time, and you know uh, where the um, increases in support for fire uh, were observed. Slide please. All right, now we're going to jump into our second study, which particularly looked at uh, data that we collected from the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. This is also a study we started in 2019, 
And similar to the previous study, we designed a uh, programmatic parser that pulled data directly down from the public websites for the Apple App Store and Google Play Store uh, for specific types of apps um, so that we could like understand, you know, specific information about those apps that, you know, are available in the backend code for those app stores. And, um, you know, the figure on the right represents information that we pulled down from the Google Play Store. And different from the Apple App Store, I mean, just a little bit of a segue in terms of like the data that's available and like the methods. Um, you know, the Apple App Store doesn't really provide much information on, you know, app installs, app use, things like that. Uh, for those who are familiar with the Apple App Store, they often uh, will rank apps um, according to a sort of proprietary algorithm, which normally includes like use installs and things like that. Um, so it's kind of a composite index, so to speak, of who's using what app and, um, you know, where it ranks amongst all the other apps and, you know, the store overall in specific categories. Whereas in the Google Play Store, you can actually pull down the total number of installs uh, by users uh, by, you know, um, from the Google Play Store. And so, you know, given the different sorts of information, we can sort of draw some, you know, generally good conclusions, um, assumptions about, you know, app use um, for particular types of apps. And so we sort of looked at kind of like the market of apps in 2019. And, you know, at the time there were a lot of, you know, sort of PHR type apps that provided, you know, there were more third party um, access type apps. Um, and, and we also looked at traditional patient portal apps. And, you know, as it kind of stayed in the second bullet, you know, some of those, you know, patient portal apps include, you know, the patient portals that are, that are, you know, developed into, you know, um, and uh, offered by the market leading EHRs, uh, Epic, Allscript, Advanced Health, et cetera. Um, and those patient portal apps also include ones that are, you know, supported through specific, you know, healthcare system, healthcare providers. Kaiser Permanente is a good example. Kaiser's a Epic user. So, you know, their app is built on top of my chart, uh, but, you know, Collecting that data, in, you know, uh, separately is important because, you know, um, downloads of the Epic MyChart app specifically aren't really um, counted amongst those that um, uh, with the Kaiser Permanente, my, you know, app downloads. So they both represent, you know, overall like Epic-based MyChart um, patient portals, but they, you know, are distinguish distinguishable um, since you know they're 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 completely different apps. Um, but the ultimate punchline here is that, you know, looking at the data, particularly through 2022, when we aggregate um, all of the installs across those two categories of apps, patient portal apps, and then the sort of emerging third party apps, we find that 99% of the total installs were the traditional patient portal apps, um, and 1% were the third party apps. And this sort of, you know, I think harkens back to uh, data that Chelsea had shared during her presentation um, related to recent HINT six results um, that, you know, we, you know, found at least amongst uh, surveyed Americans who have multiple patient portals, you know, 5% said that they use an app like a PHR app, like Apple Health, like Common Health, for example. Um, to access their medical records or to at least combine um, different patient portals together in one. And, you know, I think this data doesn't tell us much of a different story. I think pretty, pretty similar. The very few are, you know, using those types of apps currently. Um, and there have been other studies um, in the past few years of more health system or healthcare provider based studies, one of Partners Healthcare, one of uh, integrated health system and integrated health systems in California that you know found similar findings where at least initially you know very few uh, patients are accessing the medical records uh, using the third party um, the third party apps and, you know the APIs that that um, enable that access. Next slide, please. And you know this sort of gets into a lot of the um, the methods I sort of went over already, but you know I think you know we looked at uh, you know 40 patient access apps um, that we found 
um, you know, as part of our market research and, you know, did have apps in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store and uh, 30 patient portal apps as well. Um, and those 30 patient portal apps represent, you know, um, large healthcare systems and, uh, you know, EHR uh, developers, you know, patient portals as well. And, you know, as I said before, you know, the, the different data that you can pull from the Apple and the Google Play stores are, you know, not always comparable. It's kind of hard to compare, you know, things between the two of them, you know, but there are some common um, data elements, uh, you know, there's, you know, reviews, number of reviews and, you know, ratings and things like that, which sometimes people commonly use to kind of analyze the app market. Um, since a lot of this uh, more granular information is really not available. But for at least the Google Play Store, you can like get that um, the app install information so you can get at least some insight um, into installs at the very least for, you know, for those Google Play apps. Um, and you know, one thing of note, um, you know, it's difficult to know the actual use of Apple Health um, since as I said, like Apple doesn't really provide many details you know, about the use of their apps. Um, you know, in the app store or otherwise. And as I referenced before, uh, there were two other studies that kind of looked into uh, this topic in the past couple of years. And they both particularly looked at the use of Apple Health uh, by, by patients in, you know, particular health systems um, and found that, you know, very few. And I think in, in both of those cases, if I recall correctly, it was about 1% of patients, uh, you know, were using Apple Health to access their medical records. Um, but for the Google, uh, Play Store, Common Health, which is a fairly new, fairly new app that I believe launched in 2020 or perhaps 2021. Um, you know, that is, you know, sort of the the Apple Health uh, twin on Google. So Apple Health is not available on Android systems, but Common Health was designed to be um, to be available on Android systems, and so therefore available in the Google Play Store. And you know, it can be observed, you know its installs and other information can be observed from the Google Play Store as well. Um, and so just want to note, as you'll see in the next slide, that the Common Health Ops, Common Health app um, represents a good, good chunk of the total uh, patient, third-party patient access app installs from the Google Play Store. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, so here's, you know, sort of your, your raw data so to speak, aggregate data across these different app types. And, you know, as I mentioned and is sort of noted in, um, in the note below the table, um, you know, in 2021, among, you know, amongst the, uh, the Google Play Store installs, Common Health represented about 77% of the total installs amongst these 30 uh, third-party patient access apps. And then in 2022, you know, um, uh, they were about the same, 77%. So they're pretty, um, pretty consistent, you know, uh, vast majority of the installs. So a huge jump in Google Play installs from 20, 2019 to 2021, 2022. Most of that was, uh, you know, due to the, um, due to uh, Common Health launch. Um, so really represents much of the increase uh, that we observed there. But as you can see, you know, amongst the, at least at the very, you know, these 30 patient portal apps which represent you know, like I said, a lot of the market leading patient portals as well, some of the large health system patient portals, massive increases in installs. And I think, you know, this also harkens back to, you know, Chelsea's presentation about the increase in not only the, um, the offering of, you know, electronic access through a patient portal, but also, you know, the actual access by patients for the patient portal and the increase in the use of apps to access that medical information. And you can see here, you know, the total increase in installs for these, you know, uh, the 30 uh, patient portals in our study um, over the course of those uh, those few years. Uh, you know, nearly double, you know, over, you know, a doubling from 2019 and 2021, and, you know, still a consistent increase uh, from 2021 to 2022. Next slide. Yeah, so, you know, as we've been doing, um, you know, throughout, you know, the presentation, sort of, um, you know, including some of these, you know, key, key stats that are sort of common across all of our studies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think highlighting, you know, 
some of these uh, some of these initial findings. And um, yeah, so see if uh, there are any questions before we move on to the next. Yeah, Wes, there's a, uh, there are a few questions in like the Q&A and the chat. Uh, the first couple were asked, I believe, during your first, the first study that you covered um, in reference to um, your slide about changes in app types. So the, the first question here is, did you find any differences between Android and iOS? And was this something that was explored? Yes, I mean, yeah, that was, um, that's a great question. I did get into that eventually, um, but um, yeah, I think you know. Hopefully, I gave like a pretty good um, understanding of you know the differences there. I mean, I think because the data we can collect, um, and actually, if we can go back to the previous slide, I can actually answer that a little bit better. Yeah, you can see you know with the table, there's you know very there's different information we can collect. I mean, I think review count is something that you know can be collected across both stores, which is common. Um, whereas I feel like the Google Play installed data is like a better, you know, um, sort of overall uh, a data point to kind of track over time since, you know, um, it involves the actual like active install of the app onto someone's mobile device. Um, but, you know, I think comparatively, you kind of see similar, um, sort of similar trends. I mean, I think I didn't really talk much about the rankings in the Apple store, but, you know, like I said, at like the, um, at the beginning of the presentation, it's like sort of a proprietary algorithm, how the rankings are defined. But, you know, the fact that in 2022, half of these patient portal apps are in the top 100 ranking is, you know, that's substantial. It just kind of represents um, how uh, commonly installed, used, uh, reviewed, et cetera, the apps are in the Apple App Store, and so kind of you know certainly represents um, significant um, significant use. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we also had a question, um, I guess also in reference to the changes in app type slide. You had a piece on clinical use, and the question is asking what type of clinical use is is covered with those apps. Yeah, I mean, um, so the payer data, um, that is not something we specifically looked into. Um, I'm trying to come up with a really good answer for this. I mean, the, at least, in, at least thinking about the, you know, app marketplace study that we did looking at the, you know, market leading EHR app uh, galleries, um, there were not a lot of sort of specifically like patient access apps uh, that were included there. There's, you know, certainly several of them. Um, but I think, you know, I think, and this is like, would not call it a shortcoming, but a limitation is that most of the apps that we found um, in, you know, those different app galleries um, were more like sort of clinician focused. And so like, more, um, you know, as the data showed, like more patient care and clinical use focused. Um, and then the administrative apps as well, which are more, you know, can be used by patients um, to, to, you know, schedule appointments and check in and things like that. Um, but less about, you know, accessing the medical records, updating the medical records or providing other information, things like that. Um, and yeah, so, but the payer data, um, we, we didn't really find much there on the payer data. Um, so it wasn't really something we actively collected and nor was it something that we actively you know, found um, through our research. All right, that's all the questions. I think um, we can, uh, can hand it over to Jordan who uh, will wrap things up. Thanks, Wes. Uh, I just wanted to, to provide a quick kind of summary of the four uh, really, I think, closely intertwined uh, presentations we just listened to and, and highlight some through points. Next slide, please. So first, kind of the high level view, uh, what, what is this all about? Since 
at least the 21st Century Cures Act, but, but really e even before that, ONC has supported the adoption of standards by developers of certified health IT. And the fundamental goal of support for, for standards is, of course, to enable an app ecosystem that really do, does two things, I think, that ensures healthcare providers, public health agencies, and other entities can access and use patient data in new ways to manage patients' health and care. And then second, an app ecosystem that helps patients more easily connect to different sources of their own health data, enabling aggregation into a single view or use of different apps to understand their health. Um, so that's really the high level goal that that uh, we have been supporting uh, through various um, actions at ONC. And most notably, I, I guess I'd highlight the certification criterion that included um, uh, requirements to adhere to Fire R4 and certified products as of December 31st, 2022, as a, a recent, you know, concrete way ONC has, has supported uh, the use of standards. Uh, the presentations we heard today really presented four different cuts at kind of what the app ecosystem looks like. I keep thinking about this as kind of Rashomon, like four different plausible accounts of what's going on with the app ecosystem. And I hope with, with a few minutes here today to, to kind of draw through lines through the four presentations. Next slide, please. So first, I wanted to start with what we learned about patient access through apps. So from Chelsea, we heard that about half of patients access their EHR using an app. From Catherine, we heard that the vast majority of hospitals enabled uh, patients to, to access information through an app, through, through an API, and that almost 70% supported the use of a standard-based API. Um, from Natalia, we heard that about half of de developers are focused on patient uses in, in creating apps. And from Wes, we heard that really almost all apps installs are of patient portals. So in some ways, I think the story here is that the stage is set. Many patients are accessing the records using an app, um, but really that that's almost always through the portal app. And that while hospitals are ready for other apps, and developers are creating them, up, uptake of, of things other than really the, the primary patient portal apps remains relatively low today. Uh, next slide. On the clinician and health system side, we, we heard from Catherine that about 80% of hospitals enable read write uh, capabilities most commonly through standards based APIs. We heard from Wes that 70% of EHR marketplace apps are for clinical use or patient care. And we heard from Natalia that 83% of companies had care delivery as a primary application domain for their APIs. So perhaps from this, it seems like an even stronger focus on developing clinician or health system focused apps. Um, and that healthcare providers are currently and, and increasingly enabling apps uh, and, that, and that many apps are available uh, through through the EHR marketplace, I, I'd say taking together, get the sense that the that apps are maturing, and we heard from Natalia that there are numerous developers with varied active integrations. So not through one method, but really through through a range of methods, including very often standards based methods. And it seems clear that more apps are coming, and most developers are focused on care delivery as a use case, even uh, to a greater extent than than um, patient facing apps. Next slide. We also heard across three presentations about uh, change over time and how these are used. So from Chelsea, we heard, we heard about really rapid increase in patient portal use from 2020 to 2022, and really rapid uh, use, increase in the use of apps specifically. And perhaps this isn't surprising given the, the pandemic and the increasing role of uh, digital health in the management of, of care during that, that time. Um, but it is really, I think, still a startling statistic. and and one worthy of note. We also saw very rapid increases in the number of apps on the EHR marketplace, particularly uh, in the early years between 2019 and 2022, and then slowing growth in, in the number of apps on the marketplace in subsequent years. Although we did see um, really active downloads uh, of apps uh, in increasing over those years. Um, lastly, from, from Catherine in the initial presentation, we heard about substantial increases in hospitals enabling apps just between the two years on which we have data, 2021 to 2022, uh, a, a pretty substantial increase in the proportion of hospitals enabling the use of standards-based APIs. So across these three, I think we can draw a, a few conclusions. Um, first, really we're seeing the increasing centrality of digital health for patients. Um, in terms of the rapid increase in use of portals during and following the pandemic, the widespread support 
for APIs by hospitals and likely the health systems they are members of, and then the, the rapid increase in installations uh, of apps um, from, from the app from the uh, galleries. <clears throat> I think a question that this raises is that we did see a, a slowing in the number of apps being being placed on the app marketplace. And, and the question is if this represents kind of a market maturation, perhaps some consolidation uh, and, and maybe a natural process, or, or if it in somehow represents declining interest or, or declining innovation. And I think it's you know an open question, but, but one to keep in mind moving forward. Uh, next slide. I also wanted to wrap up with a few tensions. So, so the prior slides were really aimed at at drawing through lines, places where I think we can draw conclusions, but there are places where I think the results of these studies uh, are somewhat in, in tension or, or contrast. So it, one, one such instance is that we heard more app developers report using proprietary APIs compared to hospital support for pro proprietary APIs. 68% of developers reported using those versus 35% of hospitals supporting them. Um, and how do we explain that, that a parent um, you know, disagreement? Well, one explanation may be that apps using proprietary APIs are achieving smaller scale. So not very many hospitals implement or use them. That may be one way where, where you would get this discrepancy. Um, it may also be, and this, this could be aligned with the prior bullet that, you know, proprietary APIs may be really focused on supporting specific use case, cases and standards-based APIs focus on broader, uh, more widely supported use cases. That, that may be one reason why you see a diversity of developers using proprietary APIs focused on, on perhaps uh, narrow use cases. A, a second point of, point of tension is that we saw widespread support for patient engagement among hospitals compared with very low installation of non-portal apps. And so it seems here, you know, the stage is set where providers are enabling the uh, use of apps uh, through APIs, but that there may currently be very limited uptake of that uh, by patients, at least as it pertains to third party apps. I, I think a, an interesting question, something I look for in the future is whether continued development of value from patient generated health data or in other forms changes this landscape. So it's very much a current snapshot. Uh, and I think, you know, perhaps we haven't seen the killer app today, but but may well in the future that, that would change this dynamic. Um, a, a final point of tension is that we saw that Epic's marketplace includes far more apps than other developers of health IT, um, 600 compared to about 120 on Cerner's marketplace, for instance. Uh, but in the app developer survey, they, they said that uh, they enable integrations at much more similar rates. Um, so 82% of developers said that they enabled integrations with Epic compared to 60% with Cerner. And, and an, another point where, you know, speaking to how um, how this plays across developers and across developers, a, a varied market share looking be beyond Epic and, and Cerner, um, uh, the, these sources of data may just give us different insight um, and marketplaces in particular, maybe more central to some health IT developers app efforts than others. Um, and that may be one reason why we saw this discrepancy. Um, so those are just a few points of, I think, close agreement across these studies, uh, some points of tension. And with that, I'd love to open it up uh, to question and answers for, from the audience. Thanks, Jordan, uh, for that summation of all the presentations. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Folks have been putting in great questions in the um, in the Q and A feature uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, folks are welcome to continue doing that. We have about you know about ten minutes left. Um, folks are also invited to you know raise their hands if they have like a verbal question that might be easier to ask. Um, but you know there is one question hanging out in the Q and A app um, in the Q and A box that kind of we've kind of let hang out there for a little bit and it's sort of intentional because I think it is a good question that kind of gets at, um, you know, the patient access piece and some of the, the findings that, you know, some of our studies have found in terms of, you know, we know that people use uh, patient portals to a great degree and that's in been increasing a lot um, over the last few years. Um, and, um, but there hasn't been sort of like a huge increase in, um, the number of you know people that are accessing um, 
their patient information, their medical information through sort of like a third party PHR app. Um, and that would be include, you know, include inclusive of Apple Health, Common Health, for instance, and other uh, third party apps. And so there's a question about how we can encourage patients to combine information. Um, you know, I think uh, that gets along the lines of, you know, you know, thinking about current, you know, ONC and CMS policy, HHS, HHS policy in general around, you know, making information more available, you know, giving patients choice about how they access their information. You know, um, and I think some of us may have, you know, different, obviously have different perspectives or, you know, opinions on, you know, on that question. But I think, you know, ultimately, you know, the policies and a lot of the tech development is about giving people more choice. And I think, you know, right now we obviously, we know what some people's choices are currently, but that is certainly subject to change. You know, very few people were using patient portals 10 years ago. Maybe very few will be using it 10 years from now. And maybe they'll be moving to, you know, different ways of accessing their information. Um, so it's too soon to know, um, you know, where things will go, but I think, you know, how we can encourage patients to combine information, I think gets to a core question. I think, you know, Chelsea, you know, your previous study um, kind of looked into how do we get patient, how do we get providers to encourage patients to access their medical information? And um, and I think, you know, it's a general question about how it's not just getting patients to do things, but also how in general, you know, um, healthcare providers and the system at large can encourage, you know, more patient access, more patient interest in their health information. I was going to say, that Chelsea, if you had any sort of like initial kind of like uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that was my immediate reaction to that question, too, is it's less about, you know, how can we, you know, um, encourage like we can encourage patients to do it beyond enabling them to do it. And I think this is where a lot of the, you know, our prior um, regulations have been aimed at is in enabling patient access by making it possible for them to access their information through, you know, the methods that they want to, um, and ensuring, you know, you know, prohibiting information blocking practices. So just enabling that. And I think providers playing a role because they're the ones who are on the front line, so to speak, and having these conversations. So I think, you know, I see our role is making sure um, access can happen um, and provide every opportunity to do so. And then um, just make um, providers aware of it. And that was one of the, you know, goals of the paper is to just highlight that um, that influence of the provider. Um, and in that case, it was about, you know, just ensuring there, there are ways to um, mitigate uh, disparities in patient access. Um, but, you know, this can look a lot of different ways. And so I think educational resources and other types of interventions that kind of look at this from all angles, you know, from the technology side, from, you know, uh, there's, we mentioned universal access policies in this case, or from the health system perspective of, you know, kind of taking away that offer in the first place and, you know, making sure it's available across the board. So um, these are all the things that I think about in terms of encouraging or enabling patients. I was just kind of curious if anyone, to Jordan, Natalia, or Catherine, had any thoughts about that too. I guess I, I just highlight, you know, the difference between making it easy to do something or, or to, to do interoperability and encouraging or saying, you know, this is something that you need to do. And I, and I think ONC's role is certainly to make it easy to, to do these things. And, and I think the question of encouraging comes down to um, providers, healthcare navigators, and others who might see these tools as, as useful for patients and, and might encourage the use in a much more kind of directed way than, than I think would be, you know, ONC or, or any other federal regulators role necessarily. But I would have like one anecdotal sort of personal experience. Like, you know, I, I personally have, you know, my medical records in the Apple health app, maybe because I work at ONC, maybe because I do this because, you know, and I'm so informed, I guess, involved in it. it there's something I, I tried out and been like using ever since. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, I think to, you know, to, you know, particularly to Jordan's point, like, 
you know, I think a lot of this will evolve over time as there's becomes more demand and, and use cases for the for the app, you know, beyond just the basic patient portal. You know, I mean, I, I, I one sort of pandemic related experience was that, um, you know, for, you know, a short time, it seemed like the, uh, the, you know, vaccine credentials were a thing. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, if you need to get into this concert or into this venue, you need your credentials. And, you know, there were some, you know, different efforts to provide those credentials sort of, you know, uh, pretty seamlessly. And, you know, others may have had this experience too, but, you know, through Apple Health, you know, my uh, uh, vaccine information was in my medical records and it would populate into Apple Health and they could create like sort of a uh, sort of card in my Apple wallet that was my credential. And so it was like, you really didn't have to do much to, to get that card. Like there was some authorization, some approvals, but, you know, basically like, you know, they could verify using information that was shared from your healthcare provider about your vaccination uh, to generate that credential. And so, you know, I think at least in the States, there wasn't like a huge massive adoption of the credentials, but, you know, I think that's just one use case of future many where like, you know, a um, kind of seamless sort of information sharing between, you know, the EHR data system to the app and then the app kind of being able to provide like, you know, different information or different capabilities based off that information to, you know, not just credentials, but, you know, perhaps to facilitate like, you know, uh, medication uh, refills or to, you know, help with scheduling appointments. You know, it's like, I think there are a lot of like, you know, broad use cases and, um, you know, I, yeah. And as like Chelsea said, like, you know, we've created a lot of the architecture, the framework for a lot of that market to um, sort of come about. Um, so it'll just be really interesting to continue doing this work. And, you know, all these studies, you know, are uh, continuing. And, you know, I think uh, one, one note I'll make is that, you know, much of this is yet to be formally published. I mean, in particular, Chelsea's presentation is on data that just became public, you know, within the past week. Um, but, you know, we're looking forward to publishing all this information formally and with more context, um, you know, in this year and into next year. And so this is not the end of us, uh, you know, talking about this information and we look forward to, you know, um, discussing this more in the future. Um, yeah. If there are no other questions, I think we can end it three minutes early, which I know everyone will love. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for attending. And as uh, said on the outset, uh, slides and recording will be available um, shortly. So, you know, everyone will be able to use these resources going forward. All right. Thank you all.